Um, Paul Krugman, do you believe that the Eurozone still has it within its power to resolve its own crisis? Um, yes, but only with a very fast change of, of outlook. Um, they have got to say, they've got to ditch this obsession with price stability. They've got to up ditch immediately the obsession with making debtors suffer. And they really have to open up the money spigots. And then they might be able to save it. But it is, it is a close run thing, even if they do everything right. But who are they? Just the Germans? Well, it's the Germans and the European Central Bank, which isn't exactly the same thing, because it's got its own culture. But it really is Frankfurt and Berlin is, is where it's all about. Um, I mean, do you actually, though, see breakup as the most likely outcome? No, I think it's about 50-50. Uh, the way I see it is there are two inconceivable things. It's inconceivable that the Germans and the ECB will do the kind of open-ended money policy that I think is needed, but it's also inconceivable that they will allow the Euro project to fail, that they will allow it to break up. So one of those two inconceivable things is going to happen, and the question is which one, and that's, that why, that's why I say it's 50-50. But you're an economist. I mean, you know these things have a dynamic of their own, which can outstrip an individual's chance of stopping it. Well, that's the point. But that's the, the, the prospect of hanging concentrates the mind. The prospect of the cataclysmic failure of this whole project concentrates the mind. So but the prospect has been with us for months, and nothing has been done. The experience, I mean, we've seen this with the Europeans again and again. I mean, I'm trying to look on the bright side here as best I can, right? <laughs> the experience has been that they do not act until they absolutely positively have to act. Um, but they have, on several occasions, in the end, done more than one expected. The, the thing nearly broke up last November. It was right on the edge of collapse. And uh, Mario Draghi at the European Central Bank did a policy that was far more adventurous than anyone had imagined they would do. So maybe he can do the even bigger adventurous policy now. But as I say, I'm, not, I'm certainly not confident of that. When is the pistol finally at the head? Is it the, is it the 17th of June with the Greek elections? Well, certainly if, if, uh, if new democracy is not first past the post in Greece, then we don't have a functioning Greek government. And I think that's it. Then, 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 then the moment of truth comes. Uh, if they do manage to pull ahead of Syriza, then maybe you get some months when they manage to run it. And, but I still think that we'll still hit, hit crisis. He'll hit the wall in the not too distant future. And possibly Spain, because we now have what is looking increasingly like a run on Spain. So there are several different ways. But the, that moment of truth is not, it's not a five-year prospect. And I don't think it's a one-year prospect. I think it's a, it's a month or two prospect. You could lose Greece, perhaps. But Spain is a disaster for many other countries That's beyond right. Spain. Greece can be cut loose. Uh, provided that you are then willing to do whatever it takes to keep Spain in. If Spain goes, so does Italy, so does Portugal. And at that point, you're talking about one third of the whole Eurozone, and it, it, it's, it's gone. And then, then the Eurozone shrinks to Germany and the Netherlands. But your argument in this book is that we should spend our way out of this crisis and we should borrow the money to do it. Yes. Um, what, what, how so, given that? We're all burdened with enormous structural deficits. We've got terrible running deficits. And you want us to have even bigger deficits. Because in a time like this, but give, us, give me an economic recovery, and I will become a fiscal hawk. I will talk about the need to cut spending and the need for more revenue and, and all of that. But in times like this, trying to slash your way out doesn't work. It doesn't work even as a purely fiscal policy, it, because it depresses the economy. It depresses long-run output. There's been a, you know, it, we, it's now quite clear that having a, an ongoing depression, mm -hmm. then I say, you know, we end this depression. We really have an ongoing depression, both sides of the Atlantic. An ongoing depression doesn't just hurt now. It also cuts into your long-run growth, which means it cuts into your long-run revenue. So this is a self-defeating policy, even in purely fiscal terms. Now is the time when the government, governments that can borrow, which includes mine and yours, need to be spending later. Later, let's have the austerity, but not now. Well, let's come back to ours in a moment. Let's just look at southern uh, Europe. Let's look at the Mediterranean right. countries. You slosh some extra money into Greece, into Italy, into Spain. Hey, we don't need to reform. We've got it all, but let's keep going. It's going to be nowhere. They're, they're still going to be under extreme pressure to, to economize. The, you know, austerity is not going away. Uh, 
even if this money is made available. We're not talking about financing uh, open-ended spending. We're actually talking just about supplying enough euros so that the Spanish banking system doesn't collapse. Where you actually do need the money sloshing in uh, is in Germany. We actually need some inflation in Germany to make this workable. So it's, it, no one is talking about letting the Spaniards off the hook or the Greeks off the hook. We're talking about just making sure that they aren't killed by this austerity right now. But the one country who in history has suffered most grievously from inflation is being asked to inflate. It's a very odd thing about the Germans, how the, the hyperinflation of 1923 is seared into the national memory, but the deflationary policies of Chancellor Brüning from between 1930 and 1932, which are what actually opened the door to the rise of you-know-who, um, has somehow been expunged from the record. Germany's actual historical experience tells you just how disastrous tight money policies in a depression can be. Why haven't they learned that lesson? I don't know. They, for some reason, have chosen to forget about that bit and only remember 23. And I think there there's can be all kinds of cultural reasons why that's happened. But the fact is, you can just as well use German history as an argument to say that they're being much too concerned with inflation right now. Well, Great Britain is an island. It has no um, worries such as the Germans right. have. They're not plugged into the Eurozone. We've got our own currency. So what's wrong with a good, thoroughgoing dose of austerity here? Self-defeating. You actually look at this as de deepening the, the British Depression. Britain, remarkably, is actually doing worse in terms of output than it did in the 1930s. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's been down further and longer than it was in, in the Great Depression itself. Um, the austerity was supposed to inspire confidence. You know, as I say, it was, it was, they were supposed to invoke the confidence fairy who was supposed to come and rescue the economy, and she has failed to make an appearance. Well, in a funny sort of way, it has, in the sense that we can borrow for almost nothing. Every country that has its own currency and borrows in its own currency can borrow for almost nothing. Uh, the, U the United States, Britain, Japan, which has a debt that is you know, twi more than twice yours, is still able to borrow at incredibly low rates. So that's not a success of policy. That's saying what a great idea it was not to join the euro. <laughs> Your low borrowing rates are not because of David Cameron. They're because of Gordon Brown. But the problem surely is that we, in common with all those other countries you've mentioned, carry a, an absolutely appalling structural deficit. And nothing you've suggested shows any way in which we'd pay that off. Except that's, but that's, first of all, I actually have some, we won't get into it. I, I actually don't really believe those numbers. I don't think it's as bad as it's being portrayed. But even so. Well, well in whose interest is it to portray it so badly? Then? There's a, it, it, no, it's a technical issue. And it, it, Never mind. It's a, I think the potential output. <laughs> it's is being, beyond us. <laughs> the te te uh, potential output is being understated. But never mind. Look, you have a large structural deficit. The United States has a large structural deficit. Um, there are things we need to do, but there are things we need to do over the course of ten years, not this year. The United States, I know very well, we need really strong policies to control health care costs, which is really what's driving us. We need, uh, we need death panels, if you know, that's what, that's been the, but we need to make choices about health care. We need more revenue. We probably need a value-added tax in the United States. Uh, those are things we need to do, but not now, not while the economy is flat on its back. Two final questions. Where will Britain be in five years' time if it doesn't listen or take your medicine? I think we're going to be looking at an lost decade, more than lost decade. Uh, Britain is looking, um, actually I've been saying this for the United States as well, people are asking, you know, might, might we suffer the Japanese fate? And I'm saying, actually, I wish you would suffer the Japanese fate relative to what you're actually experiencing. But say it which is a, but, but for Britain, it is, in fact, uh, we're looking at no hint of a real recovery. We're just looking at an endless, endless slump uh, with no hope of relief. And in your own country, Obama well, versus Romney, the economy is stupid? Well, I mean, who will win the election? My guess is Obama, though it's by no means a sure thing, but the economy, the economy actually, we are having some signs of recovery, which happen to be strongest in the industrial Midwest, which is also the, the swing votes. So it's probably Obama, though not for sure. Um, I, hope that, uh, I hope that Romney, if, he's, if elected, won't implement the policies he's claiming he will implement, which would be utterly disastrous. Paul Krugman, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you.